I think you guys know how I feel about these task forces. When Bernie Sanders initially came out with his Joe Biden endorsement and announced the formation of these unity task forces, I, I mean... I wasn't very keen on them, right? I, I think that it's largely pointless, it's not going to lead to anything, but I wasn't necessarily of the belief that these task forces could some way be harmful to the left, because why would they? They're pointless, but I actually have kind of changed my mind. I think they could actually be harmful, because I think it could be a way of placating the left, or at least getting us to be silent, being less critical of Joe Biden if he is some way able to convince us that we were heard and he adopted some of our policies. I don't know if you've ever like had a younger brother or sister or a cousin or a nephew in my case, and you really wanna play video games and they wanna play too, but you don't wanna let them have a turn. So you unplug the controller from the console and you give that to them while you play. And you know, it, it seems like they're doing something. They think that they're winning, but really it's you. This is how the task forces feel to me. It feels like, you know, Joe Biden and Democrats unplugged the controller from the console and they handed it to us and they're trying to make it seem as if we're doing something, we're steering, we're, we're making a difference. But in actuality, we're not really going to make a difference. Um, and that's the least of my concerns. My concern is that we get duped into thinking that these helped us and we kind of let our foot off the gas. So before I kind of dive into more of my opinion on this, we did get some news about the makeup of these task forces, and as Bloomberg's Jennifer Epstein points out, new this morning, Biden and Sanders roll out the members of the six unity task forces that will offer recommendations to the DNC platform committee and to Biden. And on these six task forces, there's some good names, right? Uh, these are people who I admire and respect. But not all of them. So on the Climate Change Committee, you have AOC as one of the co-chairs, and the other co-chair, for whatever reason, is John Kerry. Um, I don't think anyone on the left cares about what he has to say. Nonetheless, he's a co-chair, but, you know, I like AOC. I like that there is Sunrise Movement's Varshini Parkash included. I think she's a great voice. On the Criminal Justice Reform Task Force, you have Stacey Walker. On the Economic Task Force, you have Stephanie Kelton. On the Healthcare Task Force, you have Dr. Abdul El Sayed, along with Pramila Jayapal. So, I mean, these are big names. These are people who I respect. But notably absent from the list of names is, of course, Nina Turner. Nina Turner is an icon to the progressive left and socialists everywhere. We respect her. We trust her. The fact that she was excluded... That really says something, and I can't play the clip, but in an interview with The Breakfast Club recently, she said she wasn't wanted. It was clear to her that she wasn't wanted. So these task forces, in and of themselves, I don't think that they're going to amount to anything, but the fact that they wouldn't even include her for a largely symbolic task is, uh, it's disgusting. It shows you that they really don't think too highly about the progressive left. Now, after this list became public, AOC actually responded about her decision to join this task force, tweeting, After conferring with grassroots activists and climate allies, I am accepting Bernie Sanders' nomination to co-chair the Climate Change Unity Task Force with Secretary John Kerry. I have always believed that real change happens not with a panel or task force, but in everyday people organizing mass movements to demand change. Yet, we should also commit to showing up everywhere, every space, where there are decisions and formative conversations with movement voices. Now, you can you can kind of hear the reluctance in her voice or see it in her words in these tweets, um, and I don't blame for her for being reluctant. If Bernie Sanders ever asked me, he wouldn't to be on one of these task forces, but if he asked me, I would say no, absolutely not, because I will not be placated. I will not be duped into believing that I'm doing something when in actuality I'm accomplishing nothing. Now, the point of these task forces ostensibly is to basically bring together both wings of the party, Joe Biden supporters and Bernie Sanders supporters, so they can come up with collective agreement around certain issues, you know, the economy, criminal justice, health care. But I don't know why we're debating these things. The Democratic Party has already sided with the progressive left. Even people who voted for Joe Biden, they want Medicare for all. This is what the polls showed. So these conversations, in my view, are outdated. We already have the policy prescriptions. We have solutions to these problems. There's no need to discuss it further. It's just a matter of will we or will we not be cowards and will we fight for it? So that's why I'm against these task forces. But when I learned what specifically the Bernie side will be pushing for, it 
led further to my skepticism in these task forces. So as Politico's Holly Otter being tweeted out, among the items Sanders allies will likely be pushing for on the healthcare task force, lowering the Medicare eligibility age to 55 and creating a universal health care insurance program for children. So what is the point of having Bernie voices on this task force if they're not going to be pushing for Medicare for all? Like they support Medicare for all, but maybe they feel as if that's not something that is realistic. The party won't adopt it. So they're pushing for Medicare 55. So we're asking Joe Biden to adopt where the party was two years ago with Hillary Clinton. And I guess hoping for some type of souped up version of the children's health insurance program. What is the point of this? Again, there's no point. And it's not just that these task forces are pointless. Even if, let's say hypothetically, Bernie's wing is able to uh, be successful and convince the Democratic Party to adopt certain things that they want on the platform, what good does the platform do? Parties put out these types of manifestos and largely ignore them. Do you think that Joe Biden will follow through with whatever the National Democratic Party's platform is? No. So it's pointless and it could be harmful if these people on these panels are satisfied and they believe that they did something. And I say that knowing that, you know, you have to do whatever you can to get a seat at the table. But in 2016, we had the DNC Unity Reform Commissions. These were actually conducive to good, right? We had to bargain with Hillary Clinton supporters and individuals who Tom Perez appointed. So they were at this disadvantage in terms of Bernie delegates versus Hillary delegates, but they still managed to fight really hard and get the DNC to adopt some changes. So they didn't get rid of superdelegates entirely, which they should have, but they did make a pretty big difference. This, however, is not going to amount to anything. And I don't like saying things like this because I don't want people to think that I'm a downer. If they're able to influence the task forces, then that's good. But as I laid out in a tweet earlier, this is what I think is going to happen if you're Joe Biden. Step one, you announced Medicare at 60. Step two, let progressives think they've won when you decide to let them talk you down to Medicare at 55. Step three, use previous negotiation as example of how you're quote unquote listening to the left and adopted quote unquote their policies, i.e. Medicare at 55. Step four, be as shitty as you've always been, but be criticized less for it by these progressives because they don't want to quote unquote lose the quote unquote concession that you gave to them. And finally, step five, don't actually lower the Medicare age at all if you're elected. So it's a way to placate progressives. It's a way to silence some of his biggest critics like AOC. And that worries me. You should never, ever be silent when it comes to what you believe is right and what you believe is wrong. However, I don't necessarily feel confident that progressives, congressional progressives specifically, are, you know, saying everything that they feel about Joe Biden. How many of them have spoken out about Tara Reid? Bernie hasn't said much, and that's really disappointing because these are leaders who I look to for guidance. These are people who I thought, you know, believed in these things, and I genuinely do believe that Bernie believes Tara Reid and AOC believes Tara Reid, but they don't necessarily want to say anything because they know that they would rock the boat, and they don't want to be blamed for Donald Trump getting reelected, right? So I understand the position that they're in. It's a lot of pressure, and I don't want to be too down, but at the end of the day, I want progressives and the left, generally speaking, to get a lot more savvy, be a lot more ruthless, and even be a little bit of, uh, you know, Machiavellian politicians if they have to be, because at the end of the day, we're fighting for what's good. We're on the right side of history, and they're on the wrong side of history. Like it or not, there's going to be a time where the current Democratic Party establishment will be a relic of the past, because future generations, younger people, they side with Bernie Sanders and his progressive policy proposals. So it's just a matter of time at this point. I feel like we're delaying the inevitable. Hopefully it's not too late when it comes to issues like climate change, but nonetheless, who's in power right now? They're not gonna be there forever. The current power apparatus will at some point go the way of the dodo and a new generation will come and uh, usher in, I think, hopefully, a new era of progressive politics. I'm trying to be optimistic, but things like this, I don't think it's helpful to that long-term goal. I just, I just, I don't. Because it's trying to get you to think that we have a say, we have power, we have a seat at the table, we have influence when we don't. 
And I think that we have to be realistic about our standing. The left lost. The people who we have in Congress are marginalized. They're getting steamrolled by Nancy Pelosi and leadership. And we can't delude ourselves into thinking they're giving us a seat at the table when this is nothing more than window dressing. It's not going to amount to anything. So, you know, I don't necessarily... Like, I don't want to be down on AOC for taking this position. You know, I think that people would have been angry if she didn't take this position. But for me, I want the left to really, really be strategic. And I think that that's one thing that we've lacked. We have kind of just rode on our principles, right? We, we talk about Medicare for all. We're policy focused and that's all we need. But we've got to learn how to play politics. We've got to learn how to market ourselves and how to create a narrative, not a false narrative. But we've got to tell people what's going on and that means we have to be a little bit brave people in congress who are progressive have to call out leadership because if you don't you're gonna get placated you're gonna get steamrolled and nothing will get accomplished so i'm sorry i'm down on these task forces but i i genuinely find it insulting because it's like don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining don't you know give me a turd and tell me it's chocolate i know what this is i know when i'm being deceived this is deception. And even though these names on, you know, these task forces are good people, I don't want them to be, you know, used for Joe Biden's disgusting pro-corporate neoliberal agenda. And the fact that they wouldn't even include Nina Turner on these symbolic task forces, it tells you how little, you know, they care about the progressive agenda. So, you know, I'm I'm not too keen on these task forces, but if Bernie genuinely believes that um they're going to make a difference. Um, I mean, I'll trust him to an extent, but I think there's better things he can do to influence Joe Biden if he does believe that Joe Biden is influenceable, if that's a word at all. Uh, and I, I don't know. I don't think that he is. I think the best you'd get out of a Joe Biden administration is him replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But any policies he, you know, implements, they're most likely going to be via executive order, which will just be undone by the next Republican president. And, you know, we're going to be back to square one. So long term, we've got to really think through what we do as lefties to increase our bargaining power to make better use of the leverage that we have. And we did have leverage and things like this, these types of task forces, it's not a good use of our time. And, you know, if it were me, if I had to say, I would encourage all of these well-intentioned good people to boycott these task forces because at the end of the day, they're not going to lead to us getting the policies that you want. They're just an attempt, a pretty obvious attempt, I think, to satisfy us without doing anything.